Okay. <clears throat> Phylum Echinodermata. Okay, this is get our little handy dandy phylogeny out here. We're talking about over here. This phylum. Okay. So really we have been just progressing from sponges up through. Um but and just because this guy's you know right next to the arthropods doesn't I mean it's really that closely related. Actually chordates, subphylum vertebrata, which includes us, uh, we share a common ancestor here with a more recent common ancestor with the echinoderms. Uh, and we see both chordates and echinodermata are on this branch that leads out. This branch goes up here, one big monophyletic group here. These are the protostomes. And then this monophyletic group that includes the echinoderms and the chordates, those are the deuterostomic animals, deuterostomia as a clade. <clears throat> you see some of the various types of echinoderms in this uh, little infographic here. This is a brittle star, a strange type of echinoderm. So, protostomes, again, the blastopore or the first pore or dimple that forms in the blastula becomes the mouth. Deuterostomes, the blastopore, is eventually turns into the anus. <clears throat> Everything we've talked about to now is a protostome. Just the chondrums and chordates are found in the deuterostomes. <clears throat> So, hollow ball of cells, the blastopore forms, it grows, and eventually grows all the way through. Here's that body cavity. Remember our old friend, the coelom or body cavity, forms between the epidermis and the endoderm. Here are the first blastopore is the mouth. Here are the blastopores of the anus. Echinoderms, echi means spiny. So think about the echidna is a type of uh, strange monotreme that uh, has spiny, kind of like a hedgehog, something like that, has spiny skin. Um, and the derm means skin, so these are the spiny skinned animals. The echinoderms. About 6,000 described species. So, you know, there's probably almost that many described species of beetles in Georgia, so this is not a huge group in terms of the diversity. <clears throat> but some very familiar animals in this group. Uh, basically, it is a marine group of animals. Um, again, I always keep saying again, but there are things, themes that I'm trying to build as we go along in this class. One of the biggest challenges in terms of moving between, um, uh, land and water or in water, moving from fresh to salt water habitats is this idea of osmoregulation. So that is largely the regulation of water, but also things that are dissolved in the water. So a lot of ions, a lot of salts, a lot of um, things like that. Uh, this is very difficult for an animal to have the physiological ability to osmoregulate in all of those different types of environments. Okay? And that's really what keeps echinoderms in the marine realm is that they don't osmoregulate. So their body fluids are about the same amount of salts and water balance as the ocean water. Um, what do they eat? They are predators. <clears throat> they are, um, well, a lot of them are predators, but then there are some that are uh, filter feeders that eat plankton and detritus. They do have an endoskeleton, com 
composed of calcareous uh, things called ossicles. And um, that's, again, more similar to a lot of the chordates um, than the other animals we've talked about till now. So here's their basic body plan. We're going <coughs> to talk about this in some level of detail, um, but certainly complex organ systems. And we see these ossicles inside of their skin here. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this yet. We will later, though. <coughs> Body plan, we call the secondary radial symmetry. Um, so secondary means that the common ancestor would not have had radial symmetry, but would have gone back as a reversal. So we see, um, you know, we see radial symmetry in the Nadarians, but then we have bilateral symmetry. And then secondarily, again, it pops up the uh, advent of radial symmetry again here in the echinoderms. So that is a secondary character. Uh, the larvae we'll see are bilaterally symmetrical, but the adults tend to be radially symmetrical. And that does make sense given um, they don't have really a centralized nerve system. They don't have a brain or a head. And they are kind of slow-moving um, predators if they're predators, and some of them are filter feeders. So uh, the radial symmetry works for that type of lifestyle. Okay. Um, Five-part body plan. Most echinoderms have this uh, pentaradial design, where there are multiples of five in terms of the, their arms. There's a central disc in the middle. There is a top and a bottom. Ab oral on the top, oral on the bottom. And that's where you flip a starfish over, you'll find the mouth underneath there. Um, and lack a brain. So, again, the uh, uncanny accuracy, zoological accuracy of SpongeBob here. So, here's the top or ab oral surface. Here's the bottom or the oral surface. Uh, flip the, the animal over, you're going to see these umbilacral grooves with the little tube feet sticking out, and the mouth is right in the middle here. Okay. Top, you don't see the grooves, but you see this little thing called the madreporite. <clears throat> Life cycle, dioecious. Uh, organisms that are male and female starfishes and uh, are sexually reproducing. Uh, egg sperm broadcast into the water, somehow find each other, form the blastula. It uh, gastrulates and develops into this uh, early stage larval phase. And then we get this bilaterally symmetrical uh, larval stage which is planktonic, settles down onto the substrate and grows into this radially symmetrical uh, juvenile, matures into an adult. Here's those early stages of the larval. Um, endo, inside skeleton, so the epidermis, the skin has many different sensory cells. Uh, the skin, again, think about ecchi or spiny skin. Um, the bony plates have openings that allow all these different little spines and these tube feet, uh, which I'll talk about what those do. Those extend down on the bottom of the oral surface. Then there are these things called pedicu pedicillaria and the little pincers that clean the surface of the skin. So if you live on the bottom of the ocean, you're going to have things trying to settle on your sponges, corals, and things. The 
Echinoderms have these little pedicillaria to sort of clean uh, the surface of their skin. And then there are these gills that um, project through the abdominal surface um, and act to absorb oxygen and uh, give off carbon dioxide. Wrong way. Okay, so here's those those um, skin gills, papulae. See them sticking up through the abdominal surface, and they are there to absorb oxygen. A simple diffusion. They are there to give off carbon dioxide. All is so. This again, respiration is a universal challenge for animals. They need to obtain oxygen. They need to burn or oxidize glucose in their mitochondria, and then when they do that, they have to give off CO2 as a waste, which is uh, the function of these papillae. Um, nervous system, again, decentralized, much like the nerve net of the uh, nadarians. Responding to all sides equally. Uh, moving in multiple directions. Uh, we have the nerve ring in the central disc extending out into the arms on the radial nerves and then ocelli are sort of like eye spots and they uh, can determine light from dark and help the starfish to decide where to move around to. Okay. So, not terribly neurologically complex. This is a very unique, really it is a, a shared derived character, a synapomorphy of echinoderms. It's this thing called the water vascular system. And it um, really does a lot of different things. It takes the place of the circulatory system. It takes the place of the excretory system. And um, it, um, yeah, it's even involved with, with the locomotion. So, in terms of its function, um, in terms of its function, or the structure of it, sorry, I'm getting distracted there. Let's look at this. Here's all the, the um, here are the words. You can read those over. I can rewind this, read it over. I know you know how to read, so I'm going to skip to the picture here. Okay, here's that water vascular system. Um, starfishes are cool in that they have a lot of redundancies built in to their uh, their cyst, their their body. Each of the five arms contains all of the same things. Okay. It contains here the digestive system. It contains here the reproductive system. And then underneath that, it contains the water vascular system. Okay. So see these little bulbs on the top and the little tube feet at the bottom? Those are the same structures here. All along each leg, we see multiple bulbs, multiple little tube feet. The tube feet extend down from the bulbs out into the oral surface. Right. These are continuous with this uh, radial canal, uh, which goes back to the ring canal, which then has the stone canal, and then exiting to the outside of the body through the madreporite. So that's that little mm, circular button on the top of a starfish as the madreporite. And it's thought that this is the intake for the water and regulation of the pressure uh, that inside of the stone and ring canal, radial canals, these individual little ampulla down into the tube feet. <clears throat> okay, so that's with everything stripped away. You can clearly see this water vascular system. Tube feet, again, extending out the bottom. So let me show you, I think this is, um, well, I'll go back to it. I'm going to show you the video later. Uh, they, 
mostly undergo reproduction sexually. However, they still retain some ability of asexual reproduction. So if you have um, a little bit of the central disc and an arm, you can make a whole new starfish. So, i.e., if you take a starfish and chop it into five equal pizzas, you can make five starfish. Okay, so um, they uh, uh, still can reproduce the fragmentation. Um, <clears throat> and that's one of the benefits of this redundancy in their body plan. Right? So, in other words, if I take this arm and cut it off, well, you'd think, well, well I'm going to be missing something. But no, each arm has the digestive, reproductive, and water vascular system that is used for circulation. This is used for excretion. Right? So uh, the redundancy is, is beneficial in that way. Um, yeah, so let, let's let's watch that video quickly. <clears throat> Flourishes. The creatures here grow extremely slowly. But that does mean they can reach a great age and great size. And they occur in surprisingly large numbers. It looks like these starfish are gliding across the surface, but watch the little tube feet. Two feet Three meter needle. long carnivorous nematine worms. Red sea stars. Look at the two feet sticking out here. Watch how they the sea floor. <clears throat> See the two feet. This monster worm will eat almost anything and is constantly scanning the sea floor for food. Two feet. Ambulacral growth. That right. Animals are swarming here in such numbers because of this. A dead seal pup. Such a great quantity of food may only arrive once in ten years. But a seal's body won't be easy to eat. See the, the different arthropods here. Nematines have a snout like a harpoon. Nematines that enables the them to puncture the skin of the corpse. That's a climb right now, folks. It's harder work for the sea stars. They feed by pushing out their stomachs through their mouths. So you see them almost inverting. The legs go up and they push the stomach out through the oral, through the mouth, and then it's it's kind of like external digestion. They digest and then they will slurp up the, uh, the result. As this sea star presses its stomach against the seal's skin, it secretes digestive juices that dissolve the seal's <laughs> tissue. But that takes time. Look at all those guys. These scavengers will feed here throughout the summer until all that remains of the seal will be a skeleton stripped bare. Stripped bare. Okay, so that shows you the use of the two feet for moving around. They can use those two feet to get into a bivalve and overcome the pressure from the adductor muscles, and then they actually. Mm, uh, invert their stomach and evert their stomach and down into the bivalve, excrete enzymes and digest that thing and then slurp it back up. And they, it works. They're very successful. There are not that many species, but there's, you can see in those habitats, there are lots and lots of starfishes. <clears throat> so let's look at some of the diversity in this 
group. Kingdom Phylum class. Phylum Echinodermata. I think we have four classes that I need you to know. Crinoids. These are uh, the sea lilies. They are uh, deep water usually and sessile and uh, radially symmetrical and not surprisingly they are filter feeders. This is a common combination, right? If you're attached and you're responding all around you equally, chances are pretty good that you're not a predator but you are a filter feeder. Um, so they're, they're unique in that they lack a lot of these other specific uh, econoderm features. And here's some pictures of these different sea lilies. They look like a filter feeder, don't they? Um, but again, here's that central disc. Um, and we see the arms coming off there. I don't know if this is the, I think this is the oral surface. This will be like those ambulacral grooves. And I think the mouth is on the top of the sea lilies. And they're filter with their arms and then put it down into their mouth. <clears throat> Class Asteroidea, common, probably the most easily recognized group of econoderms, the sea stars. A lot of intertidal. So the intertidal zone is that zone that is dry at high tide, wet at low tide. No, wet at high tide, low, yeah. Hell, when the low tide, tide goes out and it's low, they would be um, in low pools or were even uh, dry. They are um, molluscivores and eat arthropods. Um, the central disc is not distinctly separate from the arms. Um, oh, we looked at the feeding already. See this external digestion. So here's the central disc. They're the arms, and they're not totally in separate type of thing. Okay, lots of different color shapes in the asteroids. Ophioroid. Ophi means snake. These are the brittle stars, and you'll see they look kind of like a Medusa. The arms look like snakes. The arms are uh, slender, and they're often branched. Um, they use those long arms and the tube feet to basically move through the benthic layer and capture um, detritus and microorganisms. So they're, they're basically filter feeders, but they um, are moving around filter feeding. Right? It's a, a different approach to, rather than moving the water and gathering the suspended particles, they move their arms through the detritus and gather the um, the small organisms that way. And here, so you see how distinct the central disc is here, and then here are the individual little arms, a bunch of different species of ophiroids. Echinoidea. Uh, those are your sea urchins and sand dollars. Okay. They also are um, feeding on um, small things. They're not necessarily a predator. They eat algae and detritus. Um, just kind of, but more mobile, walking along on the bottom of the of the ocean, um, and use their two feet. To look for food. Um, spines uh, movable, sharp, and venomous, particularly on some of these sea urchins. So, at first, you know, it you can't see much of a relationship between the sand dollar and a uh, sea star, but when you look closely. Uh, you see these five pentaradial design. Um, if you flip it over, you can see where the two feet stick out. Uh, and the same thing with the sea urchins. You flip them over, there's that oral, there's their mouth. And then they do have the little um, 
five little groups where the two feet stick out. And then finally, the last class, Holothroidea. This one is very strange, certainly to me kind of the most difficult to see the correspondence between um, sea cucumbers and other types of echinoderms. Um, mostly deep water, mostly dioecious. Uh, they kind of look like a mollusk, like a slug. Um, but so now they are, they've gone from bilateral uh, ancestor, probably the first type of echinoderm would have been secondarily radially symmetrical. And now this sort of like radially symmetrical um, group has gone back to bilateral symmetrical. And I, well, the way I think about this is to say if this is a, a starfish with all of its um, with all of its arms, if you kind of spread those arms back up, <clears throat> and then the mouth is at the, the front end of the the um, the animal, um, and they do have the two feet um, around their mouth. Let, let's, let me see if I can find a picture of one of these things. Yeah, so here is the mouth end and here are modified tube feet and there's the little spines and so these would have been the ambulacral grooves these are tube feet <clears throat> this allows the the sea cucumber to move along on the bottom all right um one of their uh you know superpowers is their ability when they are agitated will actually um, expel their viscera, their gonads, their uh, testicles, and whatever right out their mouth, um, then regenerate that. A very effective uh, way of um, sort of deterring a predator. Um, some of them have a little fish that lives in their anus. Yeah, their anus. Um, pretty awesome. It's called the pearl fish. And when the fish gets uh, scared, it just zoop, goes right back in the pearl fish's butt. Uh, let's watch sea pigs. Well, maybe not. Anyways, there's a funny video out there about called sea pigs. Check it out. Um, here's the Echinodermata, this one branch. So what we're looking at here is if you take if you take this branch here and you split it out, and if you put so the first one would go off here that we've been talking about with the crinoids and then the asteroids. And then the ophiroids and the echinoids and then the holothroids. So the more two most recently established groups of econoderms would be the echinoids and the holothroids. Uh, the oldest would have been these uh, crinoids. Okay. So we are now in this other branch of the animal family tree we've talked about the echinoderms today that leaves us with one phylum for the rest of the semester but which is the most probably arguably the one of the more interesting groups so from here we're going to pick up talk about fishes amphibians reptiles including the birds mammals and then that's it for the semester the protostomia this is the group that includes both the Lophodrocozoans, or the platyhelminths, mollusks, and annelids, and then the ichdysozoans, which includes the arthropods and nematodes. So, so yeah, um, that is the echinoderms.